Joseph, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Perhaps we can be begin by just sort of bringing uh, our listeners up to date, those people who may not be familiar with your work, and just I'd like you to kind of speak to how you see the current system of education in our country, the state of that. Education? Yes. Well, now there, I've just... Or just learning in school. Uh, just recently completed a whole series of workshops and conferences with teachers and educators. It's kind of interesting. I think of the comments at a university where we talked about 100 teachers all day. And one of them said that she'd been teaching for 25 years and that nothing was working with her little second graders anymore, that they were more and more uneducable all the time. And then she concluded her talk by saying, all they want to do is be held, and I can't hold 30 children at once. And then this lady wept, and a lot of the other teachers in the audience wept with her. And they all seem to be in sort of the same shape. They're seriously concerned about their children. I think of the health edu was head of health education and welfare the other day in the, on the, uh, in the newspapers spoke rather disparagingly of the teachers and education in general. And, and we hear that all the time. Schools are being pilloried right and left and teachers faulted for what's happening. And one of the things I'm saying to audiences all over, and I certainly talk to an awful lot of people every year, and I preface it by saying, as I'm father of five children, 11 grandchildren, and I'm, I feel this as keenly as anyone can, that the schools have fallen down. They're falling apart. They're, they're moving toward bankruptcy because they're having to deal with damaged goods, and that hurts. Uh, the, the children themselves are damaged children, and until we recognize that the child has been damaged and stop that damage, our attempts to revitalize education are simply going to fall, fall apart. It's not going to work. Is this because most of our children are coming from dysfunctional families? Is that the reason? Well, the dis dysfunction of a family is the dysfunction of a child. I mean, it's all one thing. In fact, I, I'm beginning to look at the whole thing that's happening in the world in general. We look at ecological disasters and what we're doing to the ozone layer and all of these things seem to me really part and parcel of the same fabric, you know. So you, if you look at the child, you're looking at the family immediately. You look at the family, you're looking at the child. And the dysfunction of the child is the dysfunction of the family, of course. But on the other hand, I think of a, <laughs> you know, you got into a lot of interesting areas here. I think of a friend of mine, Michelle O'Dont, a me medical doctor from Pretty Vieux Hospital in France, or used to be, and he referred to our American idea of the nuclear family, which is what's falling apart, as a rather unrealistic idea to begin with. He said the nuclear family is successful only when it's the nucleus of an extended family. Strip away the extensions and the nucleus implodes, you see. It'll almost destroy itself because it's an unnatural situation. So we look at what's happening in the families in America and we find it, it it's all pervasive. I mean, we can't say, aha, the, the fault of the child it lies in the fault of the family. We're looking at a general breakdown all the way around. And this, of course, then reflects in education, but it reflects in many other areas at the same time. Well, how is the child affected and when? I mean, does this happen early on uh, in the first few years? Well, I'm in coming up in Massachusetts, the University of Massachusetts in Amherst, we have a, a conference the International Perinatal Psychology Conference, I think it's what it's called, long title, Dr. Thomas Verney from Canada's organization. And this is their annual meeting, Lee Salk, you might know the work of Lee Salk, and I are the two keynote speakers uh, for that conference, and a lot of people are expected to be there. And here the issue is the influence on the child in the mother's womb, uh, and what all of the effects are of prenatal experience and then the experience of the birth process itself. So you've, you have to start way back there if you want to look at the dysfunctional child and see what makes that child dysfunctional. I think there's this myth you know, somehow that uh, permeates American life that uh, young children, particularly babies, uh, are not really conscious enough to really learn or to know what's happening around them. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's really quite not, not true, is it? Well, uh, we find that, uh, of course, all of the lang all, all of the intelligences, look at Howard Gardner's studies at Harvard, he says, in effect, all of, the in all of the intelligences which make up human experience are 
in effect, innate within us. We are born with them. Our brain is organized, in effect, to, to resonate with these basic intelligences that make up human experience. And we know that language intelligence starts unfolding in the seventh month in our mother's womb. And you never teach a child language. You use language around a child. Language starts unfolding in a regular, logical uh, pattern. So we know that a great deal of learning takes place in the mother's womb, and particularly in regard to emotional relations and the whole emotional structure, the which, uh, definite part of the brain system. We call it the emotional cognitive brain. And that begins its, its major formations right there according to the emotional state of the mother. And we find the emotional state of the mother certainly does impact the state of the child. Look at all the business now about the children being born to mothers who are on drugs, alcohol, and all these things, and the profound effect it has on the child. Now, some of those are strictly physiological, but we find many, many other uh, imprintings that take place in the womb. Uh, Michel Odant, again, thinking of <coughs> his work, he claims that that the whole immune system is locked into an almost inviolable lifelong pattern by the early birth experience and, and the hours and days immediately following birth. And he makes such outlandish claims. We have to remember he's a very brilliant medical doctor that he can look at a 45-year-old person and tell pretty much what their birth history and early developmental history is like because that pattern locked in then determines the way the immune system functions and the health capacity of the body functions for the rest of our life. So these are rather sobering uh, kind of facts from the medical people if we start and re-examine our attitude toward infants and children. You mentioned the emotional cognitive part of the brain. You talk about the triune brain. Maybe you could describe that for us. I think we talked about that the last time I was here. Yeah, it'd be nice to yes, hear that indeed. again. Well, of course, this comes out of Paul McLean's work <coughs> and has, has been pretty much verified by research in all research groups all over the world that we have three distinctly different structures in our, our skulls. One is the sensory motor brain, which gives us our physical information and our ability to respond on a physical level to physical types of information or an exterior world, if you like, the world of the body and other physical bodies. Uh, that's a, a brain we've inherited from the reptilian era of evolutionary history. And superposed over that, wrapped around it, is an emotional cognitive structure which we inherited from all the mammalian species and that development on Earth. And that's the brain that relates everything together. That's the brain that controls the immune system, the body's healing response, all relationships, you know, how you feel toward your wife or anything else is controlled by this incredibly complex and mysterious part of the brain system. And we find that that part of the brain has direct neural connections to the heart. And there's this dialogue going on, a biodynamic feedback system between the heart <coughs> and that, uh, that emotional cognitive structure of the brain. As you know, recently they've found that, um, that um, the heart is one of the major controlling factors in the whole immune system, in, in, in the endocrine glandular system, in the way the emotional cognitive brain operates. There's, in fact, a, a hormone called ANF, which is produced by the atria, a little area of the heart near the, the pacemaker, that has a profound effect on the pineal body, um, on the pituitary, on the amygdala and the hypothalamic areas, which determines not only our immune systems, but our relationships, our, our moods, how we respond to information, whether we go into a flight-fight stance or a great expansive love and, and a high creative process, all of that determined by signals apparently coming from the heart. And the heart, of course, is to totally dependent upon its signals coming from the brain. So we find this, this marvelous biofeedback loop between the heart and the, and the brain structure itself that we find in all life processes. There are no singular processes. Everything is a, is a, is a feedback process with the total body. <coughs> and so we find that within this, we, uh, we uh, have this um, statement, you know, about the affairs of the heart, and we find now that it's, it's certainly far more than just a metaphor. It's a very real thing. And then, of course, the third brain is the great intellectual creative brain, the one up on top, which is five times bigger than the other two put together. And yet, strangely enough, we find that the, the vast majority of our life experience comes from those two rather ancient animal brain structures, and not too much of it from the great neocortex. Well, what, is, what is your theory about why that is? Well, 
there, there are many reasons that, that uh, we apparently are not using the neocortex anywhere near as efficiently as it can be used. Some of the people, some of the brain people, uh, ne neurological people, claim that we only use about 10% of the neocortex, but that really won't hold up because we find the brain is always operating as an integral unit. That is, you fire it in, and it's going to operate as a whole, so you're not going to have 10% of it operating and 90% not operating. But now when you come to efficiency or capacity, that's a different matter. And so we find that we're probably operating at 10% efficiency. It's like the difference between my muscles. If I take off my shirt and look at them, and one of these great bodybuilders, you know, we're all using all of our muscles, but mine are like little strings hanging on a, a bone, and here theirs are like these great dirigibles or blimps. It's all the same muscle, but who has made the most efficient use of theirs? And I think that <clears throat> with our, our brains, probably, we, most of us are mentally like I am muscularly. <laughs> it might be that nature intended that we be that great big huge mental muscle of, of real development. So we have to really examine why this, this takes place. And we find evidence that in the growth spurts accompanying each of the stages of development in the first 15 years and what goes on, that if we don't give the proper response, the proper stimulus, the proper encouragement of the child, that there is literally a failure to develop the brain. And so it, it, again, it's the nature nurture. We find that all of the intelligences are built in, uh, that they're all innate, and pr nature provides that they unfold in their proper appropriate blocks at the right time, you see, and gives brain growth spurts that we might then have the, the machinery up there for handling these new intelligences. But no intelligence can unfold unless we're given a model out there in the world of someone who has developed that intelligence to a functional level. And so if we don't get that model, that intelligence is not going to unfold. And it'll unfold probably only to the degree that the model has unfolded that intelligence. I think of Gazzaniga's work at Cornell uh, he says, by and large, it seems that the environment is only inhibitive and destructive to the real development of the brain, which is a tragedy because without the environment, nothing happens. I'm speaking with Joseph Chilton Pierce, author of The Magical Child and The Magical Child Matures. We'll be right back. Joe, so it occurs to me that I think that generally we've had this idea that intelligence lies just in within the brain. And from what you're saying, I hear you're suggesting that intelligence is, goes beyond just the brain. Maybe we could talk a little bit about that. Does the connection between the heart and the brain, for example, suggest that intelligence really is something larger than the physical organ, the brain? Well, if, if, of course, down through the ages, our great saints and sages have always claimed that the true seat of the mind is in the heart. We've all heard that a great deal. And certainly my my uh, meditation teacher, Guru Mai, talks constantly about the intelligence of the heart, and we have always thought of this as simply a metaphor. But now we're finding that it is <coughs> far more than a metaphor, and that we're talking about some very real physiological processes going on between the mind and the heart. What we find also is the heart apparently is a transpersonal or an impersonal, non-personal type of intelligence, not verbal or anything like that, that the heart operates on the brain by simply changing the brain's structure. It changes its alignment, uh, its integration. Uh, and so the uh, effect on, the, on the, the brain of the heart is profound and yet not personal. So we, we think of the two poles of our existence as being the universal intelligence of the heart and a very specific individual intellect up in our head. And that's me up here in the head, but that down in the heart is also me, but that's a far more universal form of consciousness. And so the, the real success of the, of, of, of the human is in the balance between the universal aspects of the heart and the individual aspects of our intellect up in the mind. Uh, I think recently it was Christian Bernard, the guy who made the first heart transplant, who said we must give up the idea of an artificial heart because we find it is a great deal more than just a pumping station. Scientific American even ran an article about the heart as an endocrine gland, that is, that if it's because of its enormous effect on the whole glandular system. And there again, we're talking about our emotional system. The minute we do that, we're talking about our immune system. So we again find all these things completely interlocked. We can't separate out one of these processes from the other. Again, they, we're a single unit, the body, mind, and heart, and so on. And the effect that this has on learning in a child 
is enormous. We find, <coughs> for instance, that um, a seven-year-old, the minute they're put under any real fear or anxiety about their well-being, simply can't learn. They will not learn. The brain stops learning. It goes into simply a defense posture. Uh, and it screens its information coming in from out there, only looking for that which will help the defense system, you see. And uh, no real learning takes place. Whereas later on, once they develop higher cortical structures, they can moderate or modulate these very primitive defense mechanisms and go ahead and learn anyway. But then what happens? We find that the emotional state in which the learning takes place locks in as, the, as a principal part of the learning itself which means if you learned your multiplication tables by the, the ruler in, in school and the teacher gave you a slap on the hand every time you missed one, which used to be the common way of learning, that, that we'd go right ahead and learn anyway, you see, at that stage. But we find that the learning, actually the neural patterning of the brain has locked into it as a component part, the whole hormonal a glandular fear response that that inaugurated. So that later when you try to access that information, you certainly can, but along with it comes all of that anxiety. And we're not even aware of it. We'll then be working away at our jobs, and we'll say that our anxiety and our stress is caused by our job or by the world out there. And actually we find that a great deal of it comes from the learning process itself many, many years before. And this is, one, this is what they're now referring to, as you know, uh, Mike, as the state-specific learning, that is, the, the uh, state in which the learning takes place is a specific part of the learning itself. So we think of the six young people who uh, committed suicide at Brand uh, no, at MIT last year, you know, and a number of more tried, but, and they were their top-flight students. And so we can think of a, of, of a learning situation which is under such a high state of stress that they have a whole raft of, of, of possible suicides, and six of them actually do commit suicide. And so what is the learning going on in that situation? Well, later when they go to employ this learning in their crafts and their jobs and so on, then they will find themselves automatically in that same state of, of anxiety in which the learning itself took place. So a lot of our blame of the technological world out there uh, for our states of anxiety. Instead, we can find that the, the roots of that anxiety lie in the learning process itself. So what we're saying here again is that the, the child must be must be given a feeling of being nurtured, wanted, loved, protected, or the very learning of their, of their life patterns itself will, will carry with it for the rest of their life those anxiety modes. Is that making sense? Yeah, I'm just, re I'm just reminded and remembering uh, the kind of pressure that I remember in school, and I'm sure that still exists in many respects, uh, to learn, to have to learn something, and the, 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 the way it's all set up, taking tests and being tested, and, and just the whole system is set up basically to almost cause that defense system to go into place, it seems. And as we're now finding out that all of that is really counterproductive to real learning, too, that the child really can't learn well under those circumstances, nor can adults. And uh, this has to do with the whole life learning process from birth on. You find that a child who's in a high state of stress and anxiety, no matter what they're learning, that is, that they're just learning of human relations, of, of, of human uh, interaction, or, or learning about their physical world itself if it's in a high state stress state, then as they employ that for the rest of their life, they find themselves in that same emotional state. And so we find that the need uh, to uh, have, have emotional nurturing of the child from the beginning of life is critically important if we want a peaceful society. You say, where, where are the roots of, of your violence and, and your uh, hostility and your anger in your society? Probably right there in childhood. And all of the, all of the uh, uh, all of the research seems to, to indicate that. Then we look into what can you do about it. <coughs> and the, and the, um, the solution, you know, to, to all this is, again, to get back to this relationship between the mind and the heart. And this, again, is not a metaphor. It's not a la-di-da sentiment. We're talking about a very brass tacks, realistic, biological problem that we face. And an intellect up in our head being cut off from the intelligence of the system, which is in our heart. I think of the current <laughs> comments and criticisms of the Lawrence Livermore group where all of our major weaponry is produced and a huge, incredible sums of money funnel through that. And apparently the, uh, the attitude of the people there is that, that what they do has no relationship to anything else. That is, they are not responsible 
for the products that they produce, that that's the job of someone else. So we find that this intellect, and these are genius level intellects, intellect, which is a purely cerebral process going on up here, never asks, is it appropriate? It asks only, is it possible? But the intelligence of the system, which is really the intelligence of the heart, always asks only, is it appropriate? Is it appropriate to well-being, uh, to sustenance, to life as a whole? And so we find that the breeding, as we do through our education and our whole thrust of our society now, an intellect that operates at simply without concern for the results of its operation, and is asking only, is it possible? then is, is bringing about the total destruction we face on all levels. I think that that same error underlies what's happening to our children, to our ecology, to our economy and everything else. The an intellect devoid of the intelligence of the heart. So my, my statement always is, we can bring intellect back into alignment with the intelligence of the heart, then the problem itself will start straightening out because the intelligence of the heart really is the intelligence of this whole process. It, it is the biological intelligence that will bring everything back into balance in our interrelations with each other, with the living earth, with our children, and so on. I'm speaking with Joseph Chilton Pierce, author of The Magical Child. We're going to continue our conversation in one minute. Joseph, you just said what I thought was a profound remark. I'd like you to repeat <laughs> it uh, for our listeners. Well, my, my comment, uh, Mike, was that each and every one of these major issues we face today, which seem to be so destructive, at root are simply the result of an intellectual interference or intervention in the natural intelligence of the system. We look at um, what biologists say about the intelligence of a single cell. You find that intelligence is the life process. And what is intelligence? The ability to operate for one's well-being, wholeness, sustenance fulfillment and that you find in a single cell look at c lewis thomas's lives of a cell and so on and you find when you incorporate a single cell into a multicellular organism then that single intelligence becomes subordinate to a far greater intelligence of the overall structure you see and then the well-being and fulfillment of the single cell is critically dependent on the well-being of the larger uh, cellular structure which is a part and the same thing with multi-organ like we are with all these different intelligences operating within our body what do we call a single cell that suddenly starts asking only is it possible not is it appropriate or a single cell, cell that starts operating only for its own well-being at the expense of its immediate neighbors what do we call it cancer cancer yeah. surely and, and and this is the whole issue that intellect cut off from the intelligence of the whole then becomes cancerous and begins to destroy the whole structure itself. And I think that's pretty much what's happening today. And it sounds simplistic, and yet, <laughs> you look at it. Sometimes civilization, many times, in fact, we find archaeology finds that civilizations of the past simply made an error. They kind of made a, 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 you might say, a national error of judgment or a policy decision that was in error, and they disappear. They've destroyed themselves uh, through some some very apparently simple thing at, at, at that stage of the game. And so uh, I would say that in, in our case, we face real problems from what I call the separation of intellect from the intelligence of the system. And we do this from birth on, birth being, in fact, I think symbolically, one of the finest examples of intellectual interference, where you have the, the intervention of a group of male surgeons in the natural intelligence of the woman breeding disaster upon disaster but of course in this country it's what a 60 over 60 billion dollar a year industry so you can't really do much about it but we know that um, that really what is happening is a, a major part of a woman's intelligence is being interfered with by that kind of activity when you look at the work of Kendall and Klaus and a lot of other people they find that the, the mother's behavior itself is dramatically changed at birth uh, Paul McLean's talks about areas of the brain that are literally opened up. They're dormant in, until that period, awaiting the signal of the mother and the infant being brought together after that birth experience, which activates both of their brain structures, aligns them, really changes structural integration of the brain system, and opens up these intelligences, which have been waiting for that moment, you see. And so you find, I, I can 
uh, speak of this very well from my own life, that uh, in her mid-30s, having her first child, a professional woman, and this bonding process that took between, place between the child and, and the, the mother completely changed her whole behavior pattern. I had a totally different woman on my hands, a woman of power, of strength, of certitude, of feeling that, that uh, she was in control of every situation, and whose, whose, whose life was now the life of that child and to make sure that child was nurtured and protected and she was fierce in that respect and did everything just as it should have been done it was a remarkable kind of thing to watch and uh, that's simply because these natural intelligences are awakened by the proper response the proper stimulus if given a chance and then we know that the child's whole brain structure undergoes a critical alignment at that period by the very same thing that happens in the mother. Whereas if separation takes place and all the, all the trauma, the damage, the physical damage, then you have that whole block of intelligences are not awakened, are not developed. And you have a lot of depression and a lot of anger and a lot of breakdown in relationship between the, the parent and the child. So there we have a, a simply a good example of how intellect comes along with all of its machinery and its machinations and its ideas uh, and interferes with a very natural process of intelligence itself. And once that happens, then you have a whole cascade of breakdowns that spin off from that. And I'm extending an idea of interference with the natural intelligence. Uh, earlier you mentioned that we do live in a technological age and we're hearing more and more about computers being used in education as learning tools. Uh, also, television uh, is kind of in, uh, almost experiencing a rebirth of the idea that it can be used to as an educational tool. What is your view about television and computers as, a po as being used as learning tools? Well, that depends entirely on what stage of development you're talking about, uh, Mike. First of all, in the early stages of a child's development, information is almost worthless. You say the child is not designed to bring in information. They're designed to interact with physical reality and build a structure of knowledge of the world, relationships, language, symbolic, metaphoric language structures, and so on. Uh, but as for information, information is incidental to nature. And even look at problem solving. We find reversibility thinking, which Piaget considers the greatest act of intelligence. Reversibility thinking is when you have a problem, you battle your way through to a solution. There's the answer. Aha. But what nature wants then is reversibility. Can you trace your steps back to the problem? See how you arrived at that. What was the inner ability of the brain? What was, what was the machinery in action there? Can you stand back from it? Extract the process, the ability out of its context and apply it to other areas. See, the answer is almost incidental. Look at Daryl Trefford, that marvelous medical doctor working with uh, savants, the so-called savant syndrome, idio savants. With an IQ of 25, they are all hospitalized, they're all institutionalized, but they'll, they'll, the, the strange thing about a savant is they have access to one of the intelligences by some fluke. Their whole brain system is totally undeveloped, IQ of 25, but because of its radical undevelopment, quite often they will have access to one of the fields of intelligence. If you give them the stimulus, you get a response from the field of intelligence instantly just like that. Uh, the savant who can give you uh, two squared to the 64th power, which is 286 quadrillions and all the rest of the numbers, just like that, uh, if, you, if you pose him with a problem. But he can't tell you how he arrives at that. He can't reverse the procedure. He can't extract out of his own activities the ability. So there's never any development. The answer just comes. And we find that in, there are many levels of savants. Uh, in all areas of human experience. They can give the answer. Nature doesn't care for answers. A computer can give an answer or information. What nature wants is the ability of the brain to be able to create, to move into areas of pr not just problem solving, but to develop the ability, the capacities involved in that and move on into ever greater contexts, correlations and so on. So the idea that a child can learn anything from a computer is rather disastrous. That's based on the idea that information is important. Information is not important, except as a mode of developing neural patterns in the brain, uh, myelinating them so we can then stand back from them, see what we're doing, and uh, come into dominion over it as abilities, capacities. Everything in nature is designed to, to, to breed in us a creative capacity. 
not just to come up with an, an answer or information. Well, in America, the average six-year-old has watched 4,000 hours of television. How has that impacted their, the child's learning ability? Well, the, some of the latest research has been coming in, which really isn't too much of an improvement over what our friend said in his four arguments f against television many years ago, Jerry, Jerry Mander, Mander yeah. and which I've been hollering about for decades, is that the content of television has nothing to do with the real damage which is happening to the child. The real damage that's happening to the child is the supplanting of play for the parent storytelling uh, and flooding the brain with a synthetic counterfeit of the imagery, the metaphoric symbolic imagery, which the child is supposed to develop through storytelling, play, imaginative play, imitative play, and so on. So that's the first thing. And But then the flood of imagery into the brain of the young child of all these images uh, is, is extremely damaging within itself. It habituates the brain, but that may mean that the brain creates a neural pattern for handling that source of information, see, that, that kind of phenomena. It's not information to the, to the child, it's phenomena. Just like the phenomenon of playing with a ball or, or running in the creek, it's another phenomena. But the only thing about that phenomenon is it never varies. That is, the neural patterning needed to handle that kind of experience can be laid down very rapidly because it's all visual and oral, which has already been established in the child. Now, the, what this means in the long shot is that a very limited number of neural circuits in the brain are ever involved to process that kind of experience. And the same neural patterns are used for that experience in every case, which means that it might as well, all, all those thousands of hours might as well be all one program to the child. You follow what mm -hmm. I'm saying? Yes. The, at <coughs> the, the recent r research they did, or, or an experiment in which they took a, a whole group of these programs, uh, um, television programs and simply switched the oral channels. That is, they, they put the soundtrack of one with the, with the, uh, the, the uh, visual track of another, mixed them all up, and showed them to these groups of five-year-olds. And the children did not recognize that there was any discrepancy at all. Why? Their brains were so totally, totally um, habituated to the source of the information that simply, simply puts the brain uh, to sleep, in effect. It, uh, it uses the fewest neural patterns to deal with any kind of information. That's the economy of their brain. And this information is all just one flow of experience. So there's no real discrimination. Later on, you will find that uh, the child will be able to discriminate, but not in that early stage. And so this is the major part of their, of their experience in life. I, the figures I heard was 6,000 hours before age five. So it was <laughs> even more dramatic than yours. And for all intents and purposes, it might as well be all one program. And only a very narrow segment of the brain is involved in any of that activity. The variation of, of the flow has nothing to do. It's a single experience to the brain. More problems in place of the one it thought it solved. As I said, each and every problem we face today, today is the direct and inevitable result of yesterday's brilliant solutions. And so the answer is the intelligence of the heart. And Grumai says it doesn't solve problems. It dissolves the situation in which the problem exists and simply gives you a new situation. And here we're talking about relationship. But what is relationship? Everything. There is not one facet of human experience that doesn't boil down to relationship between myself and myself, myself and my body, myself and my mind, myself and my spirit, myself and you and the world, and on and on it goes. It's all relationship. And it's all controlled, what? By that heart. The heart is the major governor of all human relationship. That's what we've heard down through the ages. It's true now as it, as it always has been. And you can put any label on this you like. You can call it spiritual or higher consciousness. It makes no difference. You're simply speaking of a fourth level of intelligence in the human being which resonates out of the heart. Get in touch with it. Everything in your life changes. Joseph, doing this work over the last 15, 20 years, how has your life changed? Well, I don't quite own it anymore as I once thought I did. <laughs> uh, I spend most of my time traveling and talking, and I never thought I would. I mean, this, after all, is what I thought were going to be my golden years. In fact, I built my perfect idealistic retreat place in the mountains there in Virginia, and uh, I've never gotten back there since. And uh, that's simply because <laughs> I got caught up in this 
in this business of, about our children and about our schools and so on. And um, I started off to change it all. I decided I was trying to change the world with this passionate resolve and anger and rage. And then I met Guru Mai, who was my meditation teacher, and uh, found this process called Siddha Meditation, which is simply turning within, getting in touch with the heart. And of course, Guru Mai does this, this awakening thing, which, which contact with her brings about this awakening of the heart, as we call it, which means simply that it, it begins to function again as it originally was meant to do. And we find that it simply changes our behavior pattern. It changes. The heart changes the brain structure's behavior pattern. I could not do it intellectually. I tried for 55 years, and I got nowhere. But in the last 10 years of, of Siddha meditation, tremendous change has been made, and I've had nothing to do with it, which is good, because if I'd had anything to do with it, I'd have screwed it up, for sure. <laughs> and the changes can be summarized very quickly as, first of all, um, a dissolving of rage and anger, and the feeling that I was responsible for the world. I feel ultimately responsible to the world and not at all responsible for it. And that frees me. I'm, I no longer have to try to change things out there. I really have learned to just serve it in any, any capacity, in any way that comes along, such as doing 250 lectures <laughs> and workshops a year. Uh, but that's simply my, what we call our service in the world. Well, we do that from the standpoint of the heart. That is, we're not trying to intellectually outwit all this. We stay open to the heart, and we find that our actions in the world are right dramatically different than they were before, and far more effective. Because if you rush into a situation to change it, everyone there goes on guard. If someone rushes into me to change me, I go on guard. So it's not so much going against something as it is going for something. You never go against anything. Um, you're not trying to bring any bad guys down because they're not any. Uh, all you're trying to do is to serve your world, serve, serve your daily activities in any way that, that offers itself operating from this intelligence of the heart and staying open to it through a practice called meditation. And that, that brings about a tremendous change not only in your, your behavior and your relationship with the world, but you, you find, and here we get a little bit into the far outside, you find that it opens up whole other realms of reality experience within as well as without. Gurmai refers constantly, you've got to hear that, what he calls the divine sound within, then you hear it everywhere outside. And that's what happens in Siddha meditation. You find it's the opening of this in, inner world of the heart, this inner world of experience. And I think this is what the poor kids are trying to get with drugs, and it's tearing them up. That's our real birthright. That's our real heritage, is this incredible inner world of creativity. And Siddha meditation has opened me to that, and as a result, wherever I am in the world out there is the right place to be. That's why I can travel and talk all over the world all the time. Wherever I am is the right place to be because I don't have to change any of it. I just serve it in the love of this heart, in the intelligence of the heart, and that's all I'm asked to do. I'm not asked to look and even turn around and look and see what's happening, but just to serve moment by moment. And that is to me the great, the great value of Siddha meditation. In case anybody's interested <laughs> in Siddha meditation. Yes, I'll get yes. Joseph, I want to thank you for joining us today. It's been a pleasure talking to you once again. Well, Mike, it's been great to be here again. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I've been speaking with Joseph Chilton Pierce, author of The Magical Child and The Magical Child Matures. The nuclear family is successful only when it's the nucleus of an extended family. Strip away the extensions and the nucleus implodes, you see. It'll almost destroy itself because it's an unnatural situation. So we look at what's happening in the families in America, and we find it, it it's all pervasive. I mean, we can't say, aha, the, the fault of the child it lies in the fault of the family. We're looking at a general breakdown all the way around. And this, of course, then reflects in education, but it reflects in many other areas at the same time. How is the child affected and when? I mean, does this happen early on uh, in the first few years? Well, I'm in... Coming up in Massachusetts, the University of Massachusetts in Amherst, we have a, a conference, the International Perinatal Psychology Conference, I think it's what it's called, long title, Dr. Thomas Verney from Canada's organization. And this Joseph, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Perhaps we can then begin by just sort of bringing uh, our listeners up to date, those people who may not be familiar with your work, and 
just I'd like you to kind of speak to how you see the current system of education in our country, the state of that. Education? Yes. Well, now there, I've just... Well, just learning in school. Uh, just recently completed a whole series of workshops and conferences with teachers and educators. It's kind of interesting. I think of the comments at a university where we talked about 100 teachers all day, and one of them said that she'd been teaching for 25 years and that nothing was working with her little second graders anymore, that they were more and more uneducable all the time. And then she concluded her talk by saying, all they want to do is be held, and I can't hold 30 children at once. And then this lady wept, and a lot of the other teachers in the audience wept with her. And they all seem to be in sort of the same shape. They're seriously concerned about their children. I think of the health edu was it head of health education and welfare the other day in the, on the, uh, in the newspapers spoke rather disparagingly of the teachers and education in general. And, and we hear that all the time. Schools are being pilloried right and left and teachers faulted for what's happening. And one of the things I'm saying to audiences all over, and I certainly talk to an awful lot of people every year, and I preface it by saying, as I'm father of five children, 11 grandchildren, and I'm, I feel this as keenly as anyone can, that the schools have fallen down. They're falling apart. They're, they're moving toward bankruptcy because they're having to deal with damaged goods, and that hurts. Uh, the, the children themselves are damaged children, and until we recognize that the child has been damaged and stop that damage, our attempts to revitalize education are simply going to fall, fall apart. It's not going to work. Is this because most of our children are coming from dysfunctional families? Is that the reason? Well, the dis dysfunction of a family is the dysfunction of a child. I mean, it's all one thing. In fact, I, I'm beginning to look at the whole thing that's happening in the world in general. We look at ecological disasters and what we're doing to the ozone layer and all of these things seem to me really part and parcel of the same fabric, you know. So you, if you look at the child, you're looking at the family immediately. You look at the family, you're looking at the child. And the dysfunction of the child is the dysfunction of the family, of course. But on the other hand, I think of a, <laughs> you know, you got into a lot of interesting areas here. I think of a friend of mine, Michelle O'Dont, a me medical doctor from Pretty Vieux Hospital in France, or used to be, and he referred to our American idea of the nuclear family, which is what's falling apart, as a rather unrealistic idea to begin with. He said, this is their annual meeting, Lee Salk, you might know the work of Lee Salk, and I are the two keynote speakers uh, for that conference. And a lot of people are expected to be there. And here the issue is the influence on the child in the mother's womb and uh, what all of the effects are of prenatal experience and then the experience of the birth process itself. So you've, you have to start way back there if you want to look at the dysfunctional child and see what makes that child dysfunctional. I think there's this myth you know, somehow that uh, permeates American life that uh, young children, particularly babies, uh, are not really conscious enough to really learn or to know what's happening around them. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's really quite not, not true, is it? Well, uh, we find that, uh, of course, all of the lang all, all of the intelligences, you look at Howard Gardner's studies at Harvard, he says, in effect, all of the, in all of the intelligences which make up human experience are...